Well, welcome everybody. We're so happy to have you here at The Late Show. I am Emily Reagan. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry at Metropolitan State University, and I'm really happy to be joined by my co-host, Haley. Hi, everyone. My name is Haley Babb. I'm an open education coordinator with SPARC, and I'm based in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And we are happy to be joined by Nicole this evening. Hi, Nicole Allen, Director of Open Education for SPARC. I'm on the steering committee. And the like, wizard behind uh, making the conference happen. I'm Daniel Williams, and I'm the Managing Director of OpenStax, and I'm also on the steering committee. Fantastic. Well, thank you all for joining me. I've been so excited because this is going to be wine tasting night. But before we get to the wine, I'm hoping some people have hopped on to Mentimeter. And if you haven't yet, you can just go to menti.com. Hopefully you see the special little code for this session along the top. And let's see, how are you feeling? Ah. Oh, I don't you, see the code. You, you don't see the code? Uh, hover over the top. Let me see if the code will come up. Let's see. Oh, or go back one. Let's go back a slide. I'll type it in the chat. There, there it is. So yeah, thank you, Haley. So sorry for that. I'll get it in the chat. You can get signed up here right now. Okay, are you good, Haley? Yep. So two, three, four, seven, eight, five, nine is gonna be our code today. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, I'm right there with uh, the ready to kick back. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like about where we're at in this conference. So we've gotten, um, we've enjoyed four full days. I mean, this has been a really awesome, inspiring marathon of a conference. I like the confused pug. That's about where I'm at. <laughs> the brain is full. <laughs> Okay, well, let's move forward. And if you're willing, throw in a word from today. Where, where are you at? Free response. Wine. Wine. <laughs> Balanced, excited. Nice. <laughs> Mm, challenged. Got a nice range. From all the way from refreshing to overwhelmed. <laughs> <laughs> Freedom. Bourbon. Bourbon. Oh, oh. <laughs> we got some Ooh. competition for the line. Fantastic. Okay, and then our last um, Menti question here is, what is a highlight? We've, I mean, ideally from today, but really anything that's coming to mind from this whole conference. You know, it could be amazing keynotes, it could be adorable pet photos, community. Mm. Really appreciated how our um, plenary speakers have been willing to come to tea times and other interactive sessions with us. This has really felt rich to me. Wow. That's been fantastic. Yeah, so Jesse Lore and Land Back, amazing keynotes, growth mindset in so many areas of open. That's so true. I just feel like my boundaries are being mm -hmm. pushed in all sorts of directions. Yeah, understanding OER on a deeper level. The keynotes were, in fact, amazing. I, I absolutely agree. Every single day has been fantastic in its own way. Yes, and I'm right there with you with the pets of open ed. <laughs> People are loving the Discord. That's great. Okay, well, I'm going to move us forward because we have a lot of wines to get through. 
So I want to <laughs> really thank <laughs> Nicole and Daniel for being willing to do this. Today. And I think um, I, this is kind of a ridiculous picture. Um, so these are the wines that Nicole um, has selected. And I know Daniel has um, like a Google document that we can throw into the chat if someone's willing to do that <laughs> with some documentation about what he's going to share with us. Um, and am I starting? I think I'm starting, right? Yeah, why don't you go for it? Would yeah. you like me to stop sharing my screen, you all? Or, or yeah. Done with the yeah, we're just talking now. Yeah, okay. Amanda, it's not an intense document, I promise you. It's just exciting. It's so okay, okay. I have to tell you all my kind of wine genesis and I'll be quick. Um, I am not a wine snob. I'm looking at Nicole to make sure she agrees with me. I, I think she's not looking at you on purpose. <laughs> I, I am sorry, a I wine was telling nerd. Haley to watch the waiting room. Okay. <laughs> I, I so I'm a wine nerd. And what I mean by that is like I I love wine, I love learning about wine, but more than anything, I love the stories behind wine. Um, so that's why I threw into this document all these like weird tech sheets that give you all these nerdy details about things. But I am not, I don't like care about price. I don't care about anything. And I also live by the mantra that wine is personal. And so I might like something that you absolutely hate and I might dislike something that you really, really like. And that's totally fine because wine is totally personal. And so um, for my wines today, um, I chose three Italian wines. Um, one you probably know like right off the bat, uh, Prosecco. Um, and so I have the Mionetto uh, Prosecco Brut. So this is one of my favorite Proseccos. A lot of Proseccos I find are too sweet. Um, they don't, they're not something I want to like drink just on my, on its own, but this one I think drinks really, 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 really well uh, by itself, but also makes the most amazing Bellini. Uh, so if you haven't had the chance to go to Venice yet, and we ever get to travel again, go to Venice and shell out the $20, I know it's a but $20 to get the Peach Bellini at Harry's, it's amazing. And I'm pretty certain that they use this, this uh, Prosecco. But anyway, I'm gonna take a quick step. So this Prosecco is quite dry. I don't know if y'all know um, too much about the way that they make the different uh, Prosecco uh, 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 versus Champagne. So they use the Charmant or the tank method to make Champagne. So or they, to make Prosecco versus the traditional method that they use for uh, champagne. And the big difference is that instead of the fermentation, the secondary fermentation that gives all the bottles or all the bubbles that are in the bottle, it actually goes and they do it in a big tank, which allows them to do it much more affordably than they do with champagne. Uh, and we can have much higher quantity of carbonation that's happening there. Um, I'm gonna, if you have questions about wines, throw them in there, but I'm gonna keep going through and I'll answer in the chat when Nicole's going next. So I'm not gonna open all six wines because, well, then I might be on the floor later and we don't want that to happen because we still have one more day of conference to go. But my next wine is a Barbera and I think, I probably can't see it very well, but you can see it in the, the document I shared. Um, so one of the most famous winemaking regions in Italy is Alba or Piemonte, up in the northwestern portion of Italy. Um, and they, first of all, this place is like food mecca. It is absolutely incredible. They have all these truffles everywhere. They're home of the slow food. So they just have just killer, killer, amazing kind of farm to table foods. Everybody there, when you talk about wine in Italy, the top two wines that come to people's minds, uh, if they're like wine snobs or wine nerds like me, are Barolo and Barbaresco, the king and queen of wine. They're both made from Nebbiolo grapes. But what they don't tell you is these super expensive wines in the region that they're grown, the people who are growing those grapes drink Barbera. They drink Barbera and they drink Dolcetto. And Barbera is a, a less noble grape, but still amazing. Um, so Barbera is known for having kind of chart uh, tart cherry flavors, licorice, maybe some blackberry, 
and dried herbs. It's kind of medium bodied uh, red wine. Um, and then uh, as opposed to some of the bigger, more noble grapes like the Nebbiolo. So that, that's that wine. If you haven't tasted Barbera, go out to the store, pick yourself up a bottle. Um, the one I shared is really, really good and actually you can get it for quite a good price. Um, I think I got this bottle for about $10, um, but to me, it drinks like a $40 bottle. Okay, so my next wine we, is- we need, it, we need to go back and forth, Daniel. We gotta go back oh. and forth. Nicole, oh, I thought we were gonna do regions and then switch over to Nicole. Okay, okay, but you-, you Sorry, really, I've been texting Emily where like- We can't have a drink until we get our I, turns. I, I want to drink the wine. <laughs> <laughs> we're dying here. <laughs> okay, I can, I can pause. Should I pause? Go to you, Nicole? No, it's okay. Just do it. All right, I'll thing. finish this one and then I'll be done. And then you can drink away. <laughs> or you can just keep drinking. Um, okay, so I just got in trouble on camera, which is so sad. Anyway, this wine is so good. Um, it, I have a tiny little bottle. Uh, it's a Brunello de Montalcino. So everybody's heard of Chianti, right? Everybody knows. Chianti, well, not everybody, but a lot of people know Chianti is made from Sangiovese grapes, okay? Sangiovese grapes um, are also what make up Brunello de Montalcino. So they're just a bunch of different, I mean, it's just a bunch of different wines that are called the same thing, basically named after the city they're in. So that's where Montalcino is. Um, to me, Brunellos drink like Chianti, but on steroids. They usually don't drink uh, Brunellos until they're like probably five, at least maybe 10 years old. So this is a real baby. Um, the thing I love about Brunellos are they're, they're earthy. They have a lot of flavors like um, leather, uh, which is kind of nerdy, I think, leather, clay pot maybe, maybe a little bit of mushroom which is kind of that old world style. I'm looking at Maya to see if she's shaking her head because I think she lives somewhere around there at one point. <laughs> um, but to me, it is a great bone dry, full bodied wine, uh, has incredible ageability. And right now they're out of vogue. So Brunellos are not super hot right now in the wine drinking world. So you can actually get them much more affordably than say the Super Tuscans or the Barolos or the Barbarescos. Um, and so it's something that I've been kind of stocking up on and just holding on to because now I know in the future they're going to come back into Vogue and then maybe I can sell them or I'll just enjoy them. Who knows? All right, Nicole, your turn. Go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> okay, you're muted, Nicole. Nicole, you're on mute. <laughs> All right, I did it. Fine. Uh, so, uh, I, I would concur that, that Daniel is not a wine snob and in fact a wine nerd. And I would say that I'm a wine nerd too, but sort of in a different way. Uh, for me, drinking wine is all about the experience and the places that I've been when I've tried different wines. And it's not, it's not always that I'm in the place that the wine is from, although those are the best experiences. Uh, but it's also being able to travel places that get access to different wines that I can't get here uh, and getting to try those. So a lot of my travels in, in Europe uh, have uh, involved um, get, just getting access to different types of wine. Okay, so I should also say that I have been, um, uh, this is the first uh, wine that I, I have had in a month and I have been <laughs> waiting <laughs> <laughs> for a long time uh, for this. And I've been looking, I went shopping for this uh, experience last week and I've been staring at them on my kitchen table for quite some time. So I'm, I'm ready for this. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk about some French wines. Uh, yeah, so, so I decided that I didn't have room in my life for both wine and this conference. So... <laughs> 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 this was the thing that I gave up, and I am, as we head into our final day, um, I am very excited to be able to say that now I have room for more things in my life. <laughs> so what we're drinking right now is going to be um, a Bargeron uh, Rosé. Uh, it's from uh, Aix-en-Provence, 
in the south of France, and neither of us can apparently show this. So I'm not sure what to do about that. But um, so for me, this is a $21 bottle uh, at my local li liquor store, which is usually the price range that I buy in uh, when we do our next section. I have some ones that are that are a little bit less expensive. And like Daniel said, it's it's really just about what you like. Uh, and there are plenty of wines that cost a ton of money that don't taste good and some that cost, uh, you know, or, uh, or I think one of mine is like $7 and it's really good. So uh, I really like this wine. Uh, it's a, a traditional uh, Southern France rosé. Uh, so rosé wine is made from uh, red wine grapes and then they're fermented uh, with the skins for a little while. So when you're looking at something like red wine, it's, oh, you can't see that either. Uh, it's sat on the skins for a really long time. But with rosé, it's only sat for a little while. And this is a very pale rosé. I really like South France rosés because uh, they are, are light and very crisp. They have a lot of acidity to them that, that makes them just very tasty. Uh, and this one in particular, it's, it's, um, I just like it. So Emily's also trying it. So I get um, uh, lots of strawberry and, and floral notes on the nose. Uh, and then the, the flavor, it's bone dry. So I don't like sweet wine. Uh, I, I like it to be uh, bone dry. And, and when you hear people say that uh, dry is less sweet or less sugar and uh, uh, sweeter wines have more sugar. Yeah, it's really nice and fruity for being dry and it doesn't yeah. have sort of sharp aftertaste or anything, it's really smooth. To me, it tastes like pixie dust. That's how I would describe it. Um, and this, this particular uh, Provence Rosé just suits my, my palate and I love it. Yeah, it really is lovely. So, <laughs> Yeah, um, so I'll talk about two other French wines real quick. Um, so this is also a, a rosé from, from southern France. It's from the Rhone Valley, which is uh, a little bit north of there. And it's called uh, Tavel. And it's one of the few French uh, wine areas that specialize in rosé. And you might be able to see how the color is, is much darker than the... Uh, uh, Provence rosé that I showed and that's because it's had that longer skin skin contact and then the last one I wanted to show is this uh, Minervois Syrah and it's actually linked to the picture behind me which is uh, 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 the city of Carcassonne in uh, the Languedoc region of uh, France and I visited there uh, after the OE Global Conference uh, or Open Education Leadership Summit, that's what it was, uh, and had just like a really awesome uh, couple of days hanging out there. And, and the person I bought this wine from said, uh, don't open it for 10 years. <laughs> so I'm two years in, here you go. <laughs> so those are my wines. Fantastic, thank you. Well, so we have, just a couple minutes left. So maybe Daniel, you have a whole nother region and Nicole, you have a whole nother region, maybe just one bottle each from those regions. Perfect. Um, so, okay, we have Thanksgiving coming up. So I'll give you a Thanksgiving wine. How about that? Um, so there's this whole new thing going on in California. Um, there's a book about it called New California Wine, but everyone knows like Napa, Sonoma, super expensive real estate. And there's all these new, like new age winemakers who are like, I want to make wine, but I can't afford to buy land there. And so what they're doing is they're actually buying grapes from people or growing the grapes, getting the, uh, the, the grapes um, after they have that lease. So part of, it, part of it goes to whoever owns the land. It goes. Well, a couple of them are actually set up their wineries right in Berkeley. So one of my favorites is Brock Cellars. Um, and so this wine, you can see it kind of is called Love Red. So Love Red is their table uh, red wine. It is predominantly a grape called Carignan. And I love Carignan because Car Carignan is like Carlo Rossi. It is the jug wine grape. That is what people love to put in jug wine. Why? 
carnion is super, super productive. Um, it makes just tons and tons of uh, grapes when it, fruit when it's young. But the trick for good winemaking is if you start limiting the number of grapes that are on the vine, it concentrates the flavor in the grapes and you get much higher quality wine. And so the, as well as the vine gets older and older, it actually gets um, uh, less productive and the concentration and the flavor is much better. So this is from a 70 year old um, uh, Carignan vine. But if you can find this, it's perfect with turkey. Um, definitely something that would be perfect for your, uh, your Thanksgiving table. Uh, I don't actually have that one open. But anyway, one of the other wines that I was going to show is also uh, a Carignan based wine. So I might have a type. Nice. And then Nicole, you want to show us one last wine and then we'll do just a quick, a quick overview of what's up tomorrow. Okay, and you're muted. Sorry, I thought I'd get the swearing done while I was on mute. <laughs> um, so, um, so this is the wine that I actually opened, but I'm not going to talk about it. <laughs> um, but it's really good. Uh, see, the, see the show notes. Uh, what I'm actually going to talk about is Vino Verde. Uh, and I, I'm not sure if you've heard of this. Some of you may have heard of it. It's, it's actually become more, more popular. You'll see it on menus. But it's from Portugal, uh, so it's wine um, uh, that where the grapes are are picked kind of young, and uh, it's it's semi dry and uh, lightly effervescent, and it's just like a super refreshing, uh, just tasty drink to have on, uh, particularly at, like a hot day. It's just very easy to sip and drink, and it's like uber cheap. Um, this bottle was seven fifty. Uh, so hi highly recommended. It's like a fun thing to bring to a barbecue or, uh, you know, anything that um, you're doing in, in warmer weather. Emily, you're on mute. <laughs> <laughs> so glad to learn about the Vino Verde. I, I'm not oh. going to... I'm not going to open it, but I have one, so I'm so excited to try it now. The yeah, chat we, we, we're twinning. Emily and I are twinning. <laughs> we have so, the same wine. <laughs> yes. I, oh, I, I forgot to tell everybody I brought cheese. <laughs> 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 and like, honestly, all I have been thinking about was wine. So this is my version of wine and cheese. <laughs> This is the platonic form. Like I'm, I'm with the people. I'm, I'm on Team Puffy, but I'm cheese balls all the way. You can only get them in like Florida. Yeah, I made that point actually. That cheese balls are very different than the crunchy ones or the long puffy ones. Yeah, yeah, no, there. I would, I would contend that these are the platonic form of of the 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 cheesy snack. Um, and I, I believe I am on record saying that uh, Cheetos are the platonic form of, of human food, the pinnacle of human achievement. So for anyone who's far. curious, th these are um, Nicole's wines that she collected, <laughs> including the one we tasted and the Vino Verde. Okay, well, so I'm going to turn it over to Haley just to wrap us up. Um, Sure. Well, I just want to say next year, if we do a tasting, I'd like to volunteer to lead uh, a Cheeto tasting. I feel like that's my area of expertise. Seriously, we need to do that. <laughs> and important. I'll, I'll, I'll have oh, take that and on. And we'll prepare better and send it out. People can <laughs> yeah. get their own. That would be awesome. <laughs> yes. Oh, man. Okay. Well, if you, if you have other great ideas about what you'd like to see in the future of open ed conferences, um, join us tomorrow at our Friday plenary. We're going to be having an interactive discussion about, you know, how the conference went, what can we be doing better for next year, and as well, um, starting to get your brain sparked about what we'd like to do as we sort of transition into a more community governed model for open ed. So start thinking about that tonight. Um, come prepared to have a little bit of a chat and an interactive session with us tomorrow. Uh, okay, so social activities. <laughs> so immediately after this, starting in like three minutes is uh, karaoke. 
Um, so if you're, uh, if you're feeling ready to sing, by all means, that's the place to be. Uh, dare I say, this might be the highlight event of the conference, so don't miss it. <laughs> um, uh, details should be in sketch to access that. And then tomorrow we're going to be having a spiral journal tea time with Maha and Mia at 11.30 Eastern. Uh, oh, as well as Friday afternoon Dungeons and Dragons from 2 to 5 Eastern. So lots happening. Tons of opportunities to be social, make some new friends or connect with some old ones. So yeah, we'd love to have you out. Great. Okay. And then tomorrow morning. Oh, sorry. You go ahead, Emily. This is usually your part, but tomorrow's the last early show. Yes, so um, this was our very last late show. So thank you all for joining us. And our very last early show is tomorrow morning. So come join Amy Tan and Winnie and uh, the whole crew. They have a lot of fun in the morning. And should we all bring our coffee mugs, Amy? Yes, yes, that would be awesome. Everybody bring a coffee mug tomorrow. <laughs> I'm bringing my wine glass. <laughs> Does I think we're doing, I think we're doing, uh, sweaters, uh, ugly Christmas sweaters, something like that. Oh, well, so we're, yeah, we're talking about it. We're, we're talking about it. <laughs> we'll, we'll let y'all know. But, um, but hey, Nicole, does your wine glass say something? It does not. Because, I mean, I have wine glasses that are like Game of Thrones themed. So they say like, bend the needle wine. wine and like, wine is coming. I'm just, you know. <laughs> Well, fantastic. We'll have a lot of fun joining you tomorrow morning, Amy. So go, go have fun at the Carrie Oeroki and um, we'll have more fun again tomorrow as well. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye.